I have the pleasure of introducing uh, today's uh, lunch keynote from uh, Gavin Andreessen. Uh, <laughs> right. so Gavin is a fan club here. Um, and I don't really need to tell you that much about Gavin. Let me just say um, three things. He's the chief scientist at the Bitcoin Foundation. He's the lead developer of the Bitcoin uh, software. And uh, perhaps most importantly, he's an alumnus of Princeton University, class of 1988. So. Thanks, I'm really uh, happy to be here. Like Ed said, I'm a, a Princeton alum, and I have uh, lots of fond memories of wandering back from a dark, dank basement in the E-Quad early in the morning after pulling an all-nighter working on my senior thesis in the computer science department. Um, this was back before the PC revolution, so you actually had to go to where the machines were to, to do your work. Um, I'm older than I look. The title of my talk is uh, Consensus is Hard, and when I say consensus, I'm, I'm, I'm talking a little bit about the, the Bitcoin blockchain consensus, which is really the, the key to the whole Bitcoin system, is coming to a consensus on what are the valid transactions. And that's hard, but Satoshi figured it out. So that problem is solved. Um, as lead developer for this project, there's another kind of consensus that's also hard, and that's kind of moving forward making things happen, figuring out what the, the governance, governance should be. Um, that kind of consensus is also really hard. So I'm going to talk about three things today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about me, uh, my role in the project, and kind of how the project works. Um, I'm going to talk about innovating are trying to innovate with a project that has gotten very big very fast, where mistakes are incredibly costly, not just to the people who might be making the mistakes, but to a lot of other people too. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm worried about for the Bitcoin project right now. And then I hope I'll leave lots of time for questions and answers, because judging from the previous panel, a lot of what I say might not be interesting to a lot of you, um, but we'll see. So I have to start with this cool picture, which is uh, me in New Zealand. So I went on a vacation in New Zealand uh, over Christmas. We were there for three weeks and went on a rafting trip with my family. And that rafting trip is the coolest thing I've bought for Bitcoin so far. And it's not just cool because New Zealand is a really awesome place and this is a beautiful river. It was also cool because I didn't know that I was going to be able to pay with Bitcoin when I got on the raft. So this, this, that guy there, his name is Finn. That's actually his nickname, Larry Finn. He lives by the river. Um, and when I got on the raft, I didn't realize that he was actually interested in Bitcoin. But halfway through the trip, somehow the subject of money and currency and financial systems came up, and he, he said the word Bitcoin, which really caught my attention. And I asked him uh, if he knew about Bitcoin, and he said, yeah, I love Bitcoin. It's this cool, you know, decentralized, more democratic form of doing money. Um, and I confess that I was the chief scientist at the Bitcoin Foundation, which uh, I think stunned him a little bit. Um, but it was a great conversation, and, and he was perfectly happy to accept what my wife used to call you know, pretend internet money uh, for the trip. Um, and I think that's, you know, this little trip is kind of the, the first time my kids really realized, you know, what their dad is doing is really kind of taking off. So, a little bit about me and my background and how I got involved in this crazy project. Um, contrary to popular belief, I am not a cryptographer. Contrary to popular belief, I am not a security expert. So, um, before. Bitcoin, I was involved with uh, Silicon Graphics. I joined uh, Silicon Graphics Computer System, uh, recruited right out of my bachelor's degree in computer science from here at Princeton, and I worked in Silicon Valley. Um, I had a, uh, a prior kind of 15 minutes of fame uh, working on the VRML 3D graphics standard. Back then, uh, I actually changed my name in 2000. I used to be called Gavin Bell. 
and now Gavin Andreessen. Um, but that experience uh, informs kind of a lot of my kind of thinking about how Bitcoin should evolve. Um, and I can't, and, and you know, I can talk more about that if, if you're interested. After Silicon Graphics, I did the typical Silicon Valley thing where I, I joined a series of small startups, uh, some of which were utter failures, uh, some of which were moderately successful. Um, so I, I'm really a software engineer. You know, my, my, my core competency, the thing I'm good at, is you know, figuring out how to ship software products. And that, that sounds like it would be easy, but if you've ever tried to actually get a software project out the door that works for people, it doesn't have horrible bugs, it's, uh, it's surprisingly difficult. And, it, and that is one of the things that, that I think I'm pretty darn good at. So the Bitcoin project itself has uh, five core developers right now. And when I say core developer, I mean people who, who actually have right permission to our central source code repository. So there's Gregory, who's sitting there, Peter, Jeff, Vladimir, and me are the five people who control Satoshi's code, basically. So uh, Satoshi created this open source software project in 2009, let anybody in the world use it, contribute to it, or run it. Um, and we're carrying forward Satoshi's you know, code and concept. And that's kind of you know, our job. When I say there are five core developers, I mean, there are lots more people working on this code than just us five. The, the last release, which we uh, released just last week, had over 80 individual contributors who contributed some small or large piece of code uh, to this, what we call a reference implementation, because as time goes on, just like the early internet, there used to be one implementation of a web browser, Mosaic. And there used to be one implementation of a you know, back-end web server that would serve up web pages. Um, that was the NCSA web server. I was around back then. I remember those days. But as the internet grew, we, there are more and more implementations uh, that all interoperate and work together. And we're at that same early point with Bitcoin, where you know, the reference implementation is basically the software that everybody's using now, but we're becoming increasingly decentralized as people re-implement or try to re-implement uh, the software. So the theme of this conference is how do researchers and developers interact more? How can we you know, be more, uh, work, work better together? And I thought I'd have a slide just talking about how do us developers interact? You know, what, what, what tools do we use? And um, we're really curmudgeons. We, we, we use uh, Internet Relay Chat quite extensively to talk to each other. So on any given day, you will find us in the Bitcoin Dev IRC channel on Freenode, uh, typing away at each other, talking about specifically what should we do next. Uh, that's, that's where the kind of engine room level business of Bitcoin gets done. Uh, eventually things turn into GitHub pull requests. GitHub is just a centralized source repository where anybody in the world can go look at Bitcoin source code. Anybody in the world can decide, I can make that code better. Uh, there's a process for submitting a pull request that any of the five core developers that have right access to the repository can then say, yes, that's a reasonable request. I'm gonna pull in that change to the code. Um, there is also a Bitcoin development mailing list. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about development challenges and noisiness or signal to noise ratio and the ways we communicate is a constant challenge. Um, there's also email. It's very easy to find any of the core developers' email. Uh, contrary to popular belief, we are not all anonymous hackers working underground. You know, our, our names and email addresses are, are easy to find. Um, and finally, if you're a security researcher and you find some, what you think might be super serious bug in the protocol or something, you can always send us a PGP encrypted email. So there's a Bitcoin security mailing list that is uh, invitation only for any 
serious security issues. Happily, that's an extremely low, uh, low traffic mailing list. So our biggest challenge is trying to kind of change the tires on this car as it speeds down the road at 80 miles an hour. Um, and the bigger the project gets, the harder that gets. And the, the kind of more it weighs on us to realize what was maybe a $10 million software project when we first heard about it and started working on it is now this you know, $6 billion software project that uh, we kind of hold the keys to. The previous panel talked about systemic risks, and that's certainly you know, the big challenge. And it's compounded by just the pure level of hype, right? You can buy a, a ticket to outer space um, with Richard Branson using Bitcoin. Uh, you get these, just in the last uh, six months or so, the mainstream <laughs> media has become incredibly interested in Bitcoin. So all of the Bitcoin developers you know, get approached by press people, uh, you get uh, even people who aren't core Bitcoin developers, I know people who contributed projects, even <coughs> academics get asked, is Bitcoin dead? Um, so there's a huge hype, everything's kind of cranked up to 11, um, and that's hard to deal with. It really is very chaotic, and from looking at the outside, and from somebody who started working you know, in Sil uh, uh, at a big company in Silicon Valley, um, this is the first open source software project that I've been deeply involved with, and it's a different way of working. It, it is organized chaos. You know, I can't fire people if I don't like them. Which is weird. And hard. But it actually works pretty darn well. And it, it looking from the outside, it, it is chaotic by design. And, and the idea is to try to let the good ideas flourish, to let the bad ideas die. But at the same time, kind of keep the system, the fundamental system reliable. Keep it doing uh, you know, what it's good at, which is creating a block approximately every 10 minutes and validating transactions properly. So as we grow up, you know, I, I'm thinking a lot about code review and testing. There doesn't seem to be any really good solution to this. I had a, a good conversation with uh, one of the core Tor developers recently. And we basically just commiserated about how hard it is to get developers to review each other's code. Um, which is a real problem if you're a security critical project. So, you know, there, there's no good answer there. Uh, it's kind of, we, we do the best we can. The Bitcoin Foundation, uh, the Bitcoin Foundation is a, a fairly new organization. Uh, it was very controversial when it was created. It's been very controversial recently because a couple of the people who are on the Bitcoin Foundation board turned out to be less reliable than you would hope. Um, but from my perspective, the Bitcoin Foundation has been a huge force for good. So not just because they pay my salary, I am paid in Bitcoin. Uh, not just because they pay another of the core developer's salary. Um, but because the foundation provides some kind of key infrastructure that really helps kind of lubricate the whole process. So for example, before the foundation existed, if I got contacted by a reporter asking me who knows what, you know, something about reaction to Silk Road or whatever the latest scandal is in Bitcoin, um, I, I had the choices of either ignoring them uh, or taking time out of actually doing productive work to talk to them. I mean, now I have a third option, which is send them to the press people who work full time for the foundation, um, who can either direct them to the right people or, or just directly answer their questions. The foundation is really designed to kind of provide for the common good of Bitcoin. So some of the things it does are, are things like grants. If you have a great idea for, for some new piece of technology that you think would make the whole Bitcoin ecosystem better, if you can't get funding from Mark Andreessen, the Bitcoin Foundation uh, might be a good place to go to get a grant to, to help make that happen. Um, one thing that's new is we have seen developers approached by law enforcement or regulatory agencies for you know, 
either help with lawsuits or advice. Um, and one of the things the foundation can provide is, is help arranging pro bono legal representation <coughs> for Bitcoin developers. So if you're a Bitcoin developer and you get a call from the you know <coughs> Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, Talk to folks at the foundation or send me an email and we can direct you to people who will make sure that you don't say something that might end, might have you end up in jail, which is a good thing. Um, and finally, one of the things that the foundation's gonna start experimenting with is uh, fellowships. So at the Financial Crypto Conference, I announced that I'm gonna be looking for a, a fellow to come to Princeton, excuse me, not Princeton, to come to Amherst and work with me for a year. Um, I'll be looking for somebody who actually proven track record of working in C++, 